Hello, everyone. Welcome and thank you for joining us for the seventh of nine lectures in Sea Alaska Heritage Institute's Northwest Coast Arts Lecture Series. My name is Jay Zeller, I'm a program coordinator here at Sea Alaska Heritage Institute. This series will feature the work and journeys of Northwest Coast artists and put a spotlight on priority issues and topics concerning Northwest Coast arts. The series is part of SHI's goal to promote cross cultural understanding. Christopher Green is a scholar of modern and contemporary art who specializes in Native American art and material culture, primitivisms of the historic and neo avant garde, and the global representation and display of indigenous culture. His current research focuses on 20th century Northwest Coast Native art and its interrelation with Euro American modernism. He earned his PhD from the CUNY Graduate Center and AB from Princeton University. His criticism, essays, and reviews have appeared in Art in America, Freeze Aperture, and the Brooklyn Rail, amongst others. And he has contributed catalog essays to the New Museum, Heard Museum, Artist Space, the James Gallery, and the Foundation Ferne Branca. His scholarly research has been published in Art Margins, Winterthur Portfolio, AB Original, and BC Studios. And in 2019, he co-edited issue 11 of Shift, Graduate Journal of Visual and Material Culture, Blood and Earth and Soil. His research has been supported by the Daedalus Foundation, the Smithsonian American Art Museum, and National Museum of the American Indian, the International Council for Canadian Studies, the Sea Alaska Heritage Institute, Lost and Found, the CUNY Poetics Document Initiative, and the Robert Rochenberg Foundation. He currently serves as visiting assistant professor of art history at the University of North Texas. Today, Chris Green will discuss Jim Schopert, Fragments of Formline Through Land and Space. As you watch the lecture, we invite you to submit questions in the YouTube comment section. At the end of the lecture, we will ask him your question. And without further ado, I would like to welcome Christopher Green. Thank you so much, Jay, for the introduction. And thank you to Rosita Worrell and um, C. Alaska Harrison Institute for inviting me to speak today. Um, I'm currently presenting from Shinnecock Territory on Long Island in New York, but I want to express my gratitude to the Akukwan and Takukwan of the Juneau and Douglas area who have hosted me on countless visits over the years, uh, particularly in the course of conducting this research that I'll be sharing today. I wish that the present day circumstances were somehow different so I could join you in person at the uh, Heritage Institute in Juneau, um, but I look forward to being back there as soon as, uh, at least as soon as we're through uh, our current stormy waters. So much of my research on Jim Schopert and his art has come together with the help of countless friends and colleagues across Alaska and the United States. Um, and, and today I particularly want to thank Jim's family, um, including his late daughter, Sidia, his, his daughter, Shavia, um, his sister Jackie and his nephew Benjamin, um, who have been really incredibly supportive throughout this project. This presentation is largely drawn from uh, my recently defended dissertation, but I also wanted to draw the audience's attention to this fantastic new publication, um, Unsettling Native Art Histories on the Northwest Coast, which was edited by the incredible team of Catherine Bum Marcuse and Aldona Genitis and to which I was privileged to be able to contribute a chapter on Jim Schopert's work. So if you're interested in learning more about um, Schopert and his art and career, uh, go ahead and feel free to grab a copy of this book. Uh, or of course, please, um, I will be very happy to answer questions at the end of the presentation today. And uh, feel free to reach out, reach out to me um, following the presentation. I'm very happy to share my research in other, other ways. With that, I'll begin. Jim Schopert, a uh, Takuquan raven of the Ishkatong clan, is best known for his large wooden panels that fragment form line into abstract compositions that reach beyond what he saw as the strict conventions of Northwest Coast art. One of his best known panels, Blueberries here, made in 1986, is a quintessential example of these painted panels as he pioneered them in the 1980s. Abstract lines and curves decorate the surface in which the knowing viewer can recognize the characteristic tapering and swelling lines of form line design and its vocabulary of geometric elements, including sections of ovoids, U forms, and trigons. Yet, instead of a carefully composed symmetrical design that heeds the rules and principles of the northern form line tradition, 
resulting in the representation of a figure, perhaps like a raven or a bear. Blueberries is abstract and illegible as any kind of recognizable animal or crest form. While hints of what might be an eye or a claw can be made out, the elements of each panel are cut, rotated, and rearranged into a format that does not resolve into any singular figurative motif. The curves of the broken form line pattern end abruptly at the edge of each of the nine panels, organized here into a three by three rectilinear grid that arranges the carved abstract elements within balanced horizontal and vertical divisions. The panels are painted, but instead of the highly delineated zones of red, black, and blue-green pigment typical of traditionalist Northwest Coast paintwork, Schopert instead makes use of purple, red, orange, blue, pink, all applied across the panels in thick brushstrokes, stains, and drips that follow the carved contours, yet also transgress their edges and limits. Schopert's panel works, such as blueberries, are often discussed both as a visual metaphor for the breaking up of Klingit culture by colonization and in their all over painterly cohesiveness as indications for how an ongoing tradition today remains strong and unified, if inherently different from what it was in the past. During his life, however, Schopert's approach troubled his critical reception and traditionalist indigenous artists and his peers alike and little consensus emerged as to what style Schopert followed or even how to describe his art. The art critic Bill Berkson, for example, writing about the Seattle art scene for Art America in 1986, called Schopert a quote, Northwest neo-expressionist painter, tying his large scale and expressionistic painterly treatment to the resurgent neo-expressionist movement that emerged in the United States in the 1980s. A year later, the Haudenosaunee artist and curator George Longfish wrote that he saw the influence of Robert Rauschenberg and the hues and tones of paint that were washed across Schopert's surfaces of carved wood and destroyed patterns. Other writers and critics uh, connected his Yupik inspired sculptures to the surrealist tradition, as well as called him a neo cubist, a minimalist, and an artist whose work evoked to at least one reviewer the quote, weathered looks of ancient carvings, yet also quote, saying with contemporary geometries. For Schopert, the failure to categorize his art within neat boundaries was a desirable outcome as he pursued new aesthetic possibilities in the drips, cuts, and curves that exist outside of the binaries against which indigenous artists are often defined. Binaries such as native and non-native, traditional and contemporary, historic and innovative, or artist or, and carver or craftsperson. Today, I will locate Schopert's work at the nexus of Euro-American modernism, Klingit visual traditions, and some of the other Alaskan native influences that Schopert shared in, in order to consider how work such as blueberries move between such binary categories. As Schopert told an interview, interviewer in 1985, his goal was to blend Western art theory with the cultural art of the Northwest Coast people. By taking material from both schools, it is possible, he says, to derive a new production, which is linked aesthetically, but not limited historically. In this way, Schopert continues, new artistic expression evolves. Schopert's abstract panels call upon the viewer to expand their perception of the conventions of Northwest Coast design, form, and tradition. His fragmentary traces of form line motifs use an abstract language to communicate broad statements to diverse audiences about what kind of art qualifies as quote unquote native art or even as Klingit art. Through his abstractions, Schopert created a new aesthetic vocabulary for cultural expression that answered a question which concerned him throughout his life and career. The question was, what would have happened to Northwest Coast art if it hadn't been interrupted? To seek such an answer, I will briefly trace the development of Schopert's oeuvre from his beginnings in classic Klingit carving styles to his breakthrough developments in geometric abstraction. I'll break down the operations that Schopert drew upon, operations of isolation and fragmentation, which were his primary compositional tactics, uncovering in the process his sources and methods for his breakthroughs. Through these methods, we can understand Schopert's work as a direct and intentional disruption of the conventions of form line design that is both Klingit and contemporary, expansive yet also bound by the concerns for the dynamic continuation of cultural tradition. Schopert's relationship to Klingit epistemological and legal frameworks will be considered in relation to his public works of art, where crest imagery and a deep concern for the politics and philosophies of land and place co-mingle within the expansive possibilities that abstraction provided him. For while Schopert's work moves away from the figurative nature of crest art, 
He does not truly move away from the claims to land and territory that such crests represent. As he said of his and of all Alaskan Native art, quote, if we don't address the question of land in discussions such as this, then we're missing the point entirely. Land relations, I suggest, are thus not absent from Schobert's abstraction. Rather, he pursues a kind of evolution of the language of rights and protocols, which are already represented by many forms in Klingit culture other than the visual. The remains of form line in Schobert's panels are artistic language that is unique yet familiar, reserved, as it were, for so a sovereign control of its cultural condi conditions. Schobert has personally described how his professional art career began at the age of 25 on February 26, 1973. He's very precise on the date. The day of which he bought a piece of soapstone and carved from it two owls, similar to the examples that I'm showing here from a, a few years later. He managed to sell one of those owls for $15 the next day, invested the money in more stone, made more carvings, sold those, and was soon hooked on the art making cycle. His early career in the 1970s consisted of carving and painting souvenir goods and learning to create work in the classic Klingit style through the study of art in museum collections, communities, and books. One such example was an archway he created for the entrance to a soapstone workshop and carving demonstration area at the Anchorage shop Cottage Crafts in 1973. The archway was copied from the non-Yaoi uh, brown bear crest interior screen known as Many Faces uh, from the Chief Sheikh's house in Wrangell. The Many Faces screen has the status of Utu and is protected clan property under Klingit law. The reproduction of the screen by Schoper for commercial scale might then be considered a kind of transgression of protocol. In this evidence that Schoper did not necessarily always respect Klingit property rights, especially those rights res uh, and respect conferred upon Utu and other kind of ancestral crests and prerogatives, is, is this evidence for a kind of transgression or dismissal of those rights? It's important, I think, that the archway he made is not actually a direct copy of the Chief Sheikh screen from the uh, 19th century. Rather, he, we, as we can tell, really, from the style of the faces inhabiting the joints here, um, the smiling faces, much more hum human-looking faces, um, the screen that he made in 1973 is, in fact, a copy of the reconstruction of the screen that was made in 1940 for the rebuilt house front of the Chief Sheikh's community house. So Schobert's art is actually a copy of a copy uh, remove a bit farther from the, the Atu, um, which is now in, in the Denver Art Museum. Some conservative commentators might consider that to be an equal breach of protocol because the 1940 copy was sanctioned by Chief Sheikhs, while Schobert's craft shop copy was certainly never sanctioned. But Jim Schobert apparently found the protocols to be at least flexible enough to allow for this commission in Anchorage or at least he sidestepped them in one way or another. Schopert's continued study of the conventions of form line and other Alaskan native arts was primarily self-taught following his childhood exposure amongst his own community in Douglas and an apprenticeship that he largely had with himself rather than any kind of traditional method. He studied historic Klingon art museums in depth and his travels across Alaska and interaction with the other native artists quickly created a proficient and talented carver in Klingon form. For example, on the left, I'm showing a wooden ductule panel. Uh, it's currently the Silas Corporation collection, which tells the story of ductule or black skin or strong man, the man who ripped a sea lion in half with his bare hands in an act of grisly revenge. The panel here is based on the house post form that's best known from the Klokwan Whale House and demonstrates Schopert's adept carving skills and knowledge of the Klingit salad acquired in such a short period of time. A very similar panel um, on the right here, carved by Schobert in 1974, while he and his family were living in Nome as pioneers of the Baha'i faith, is now housed at the Alaska Baha'i National Center in Anchorage. In both of these panels, while Schobert hasn't filled every inch of the thin cedar panels, his deployment of ovoids, U-forms, and trigons throughout the figures demonstrates his early proficiency with these basic elements of northern form line design. Schobert began his Western style fine arts education with an Associates of Fine Arts degree from Anchorage Community College in 1975, followed by a BFA from the University of Alaska Anchorage in 1978, where he studied, in his words, the art of, quote, Western civilization. For Schopert, learning from the world arts and modern Euro-American art in particular was essential to the process of maintaining cultural heritage, while also balancing new attitudes and techniques amidst the tremendous upheaval produced when, as he wrote, quote, two or more societies collide and one prevails. 
Chopra trained in a diverse range of media materials and studied Euro-American art history, which exposed him to new sculptural techniques and ideas that would influence his career going forward. Looking to the history of modern European sculpture, he made a leap into abstract geometric sculpture in the mid-1970s. His limestone sculpture, titled Six of One, Half Dozen of the Other, as I'm showing now, for example, consists of two smooth white shapes, a rectangular prism standing vertically with a cylindrical quadrant resting its curved side atop the upper face of the prism. With its lack of plinth and bare materiality, the work evokes the geometric abstraction of Constantine Brancusi's early 20th century sculpture, a reference that uh, Schobert frequently evoked in his artwork and explicitly in his personal writings from the time. While I'm not gonna go today further into these works, I will just point to the ways that Schopper brought an indigenous sense of materiality into conversation with the modernist sculpture Brancusi. For example, here in Two Birds with his use of copper, or here in his piece Meditation in Ivory, in his use of, uh, in his use of ivory as an elegant compositional material, um, drawing on Brancusi's uh, frequently reproduced um, bust of Mademoiselle Bogany. So while Northwest Coast art has its own long history of abstraction, Schopert moved from abstract geometric sculpture uh, taken up during his um, artistic um, uh, fine arts training. And he moved from that to an abstraction and a distillation and a disruption of form line design through two operations that I'll explore today. The isolation of certain elements and their fragmentation. Through variations in size and arrangement, these methods allowed him a host of compositional possibilities as his prolific production of these panels throughout the 1980s suggests. In 1979, Schopert moved to Seattle to pursue an MFA at the University of Washington. That's where he made his breakthrough into and the discovery that would provide him the means of investigating Northwest Coast form line while continuing to engage the tenets of geometric abstraction and painterly composition that he picked up in his fine arts training. Schopert's initial process consisted of an isolation method. He later described that after working with form line so intently in his early years, he ba began to quote, looking at the form line as an artistic process rather than as a means of expressing an object or as a social comment, I determined that the form line with its intrinsic qualities of power and movement could be a statement in itself, a strong calligraphic gesture with no cultural meaning or intent. The more I worked with this notion, the more I began to isolate portions of the form line. I'll say that again, isolate portions of the form line allowing it to make its own statement, end quote. So when Schobert says isolate portions of the form line, he means it in quite a literal sense, and I'll, I'll show you how. Taking classic form line designs of his own making, such as this design for a bear panel from 1979, Schobert would isolate an element of the whole by taking a snapshot selection. For example, by laying a blank piece of paper with a rectangular hole on top of it over a photocopy of the composition in order to frame a section. Seen here, Schopert set a top sheet at an angle to a photocopy of the bear panel design and traced and extracted the portions that were visible through the rectangular frames. Once removed from the overall design, these isolated forms from the tracing would appear as abstract forms rather than as parts of the original figurative composition. Schopert used this particular method as the basis for a number of compositions, um, including this public art commission proposal titled Salmon, Halibut, and Other Sea Life. This collage pencil study depicts an 8 by 32 foot carved relief panel, I'm showing a detail here, um, that was intended for an exterior wall. And we see these cutout figures, photos of cutout figures added for scale. Close comparisons show that the design from um, Salmon, Halibut, and Other Sea Life aligns with a particular isolated section of the right-hand side of the bear panel design. Schopert's pencil shading provides a kind of relief, a sense of depth for which portions of the design will be carved in relief. Compared to the original bear panel, these areas of relief align for the most part with where the panel has likewise been finished and carved in relief, following certainly the principles of classic Klingit style. But in the abstract pencil drawing, the distinction between primary and secondary black and red form line has been lost, has been removed, where each curve assumes an equal weight within the abstract composition. This proposal was executed in 1984 as the monumental 32 foot long and seven foot high carved and painted panel titled Big Sky Salmon.
currently installed at the Fort Richardson State Fish Hatch in their full acrylic. And he left the raised sections in their natural coloring of a kind of orange brown, um, uh, the color of the naturally treated cedar wood. By painting the recessed areas of the design and leaving the raised portions bare, Schopert reverses the typical color conventions of form line design, where pigment would normally denote the primary and secondary form line, and the negative form would be left largely, um, largely natural. By painting the negative zones and leaving the positive lines um, unpainted, Schopert is also subtly playing with the figure ground relationship in a way that further abstracts the work. So unlike the original bare panel design, I'll stick with the previous image, uh, the original bare panel source, in which the black form lines of the design produce a figure upon a wooden ground, here by painting the recessed negative portions white, the truncated form line elements do not give any real sense of a figure ground relation. As the curves are cut off at the edges of the panel, the effect is a real visual flattening of the abstracted image in a push and kind of pull um, that's at play with the carving, which is in a, a fairly shallow relief. Today, after 35 years of exposure to the elements, the carved reliefs panels are quite bare. The paint has largely been rubbed off by repeated wind, snow, and rain. The shallow relief of the design is faintly visible in the naked and warping wood. The hatchery building on which the panel is located is now abandoned, and it will be demolished in the near future by the Department of Fish and Game. It's only through the attempted interventions of Jim Schopert's sister, Jackie Schopert, and his nephew, Benjamin Schleifman, that we can thank them for the work not having already been demolished. The fishery workers did not realize it was a work of art at all, because in its, in its um, warped and largely colorless fashion, the original intent of Schopert's coloring has been lost. The COVID pandemic has made progress on saving this work extremely difficult. Um, but, but today, I urge anyone in the audience who might have the means or the institutional support um, and who may be interested in trying to help save this work from destruction, please reach out or get in touch with myself or Benjamin Schleifman um, so this magnificent panel can be saved and restored in the near future. Really, what's interesting for us today is that as a monumental public work, Big Sky Salmon has much to say about the relationship between Klingit values and the history of modern public art and abstraction. On the one hand, Big Sky Salmon extends the Klingit practice of monumental public art into very new forms. The facades of Klingit clan houses and interior screens, like at the Chief Sheikh's house in Wrangell, throughout history have displayed lineage and clan crests within painted and carved designs, sometimes, in, in fact, often verging on the non-representational and the abstract and geometric. These uh, architectural displays can carry names and lineages, while their crest designs often bear the status of a'u, um, the public display of which can also function as claims to land, territory, and resources. But what kind of relationship does an abstract composition on a hatchery building on an army base outside of Anchorage, far north of Klingit territory, have with those kinds of prerogatives, the kinds of prerogatives that are embedded in the history of Klingit architectural painting? The title of the mural panel here evokes the specific context of the site, Big Sky Salmon. According to Schopert, it refers to the ambitions of the hatchery to replenish the rivers and streams with salmon, which was once a plentiful resource. And Big Sky is a moniker for the Anchorage area countryside, the, the flatness with the large mountains on the sky of the horizon, a big sky kind of country. Yet the bear motif from which the design is derived does not bear the status of Aru, nor could most viewers even extrapolate the original figure of design from this isolated portion on the hatchery panel um, from which it's been taken. So how could any kind of crest function or um, possibly communicate the specificity of Klingit lineage and land claims once it's been so thoroughly abstracted? And what is the relationship between abstraction and these forms and these kinds of land capes and claims for Schopert? Schopert pushed these kinds of questions further and further and extended his abstracting operation by fragmenting smaller sections of his classic form line panels. He described this technique as taking the structured art of the Klingit and, quote, fragmenting it and recombining the parts in different kinds of patterns, end quote. Practically, this process began with Schopert literally cutting photocopies of his compositions by hand into a variety of shapes. Whoops. Squares, rectangles, long thin strips, and scraps of ovoids which remain in his personal papers as evidence of the process. He then arranged these free-floating fragments into linear arrangements and grids. 
A study for a public art commission proposal titled Fragments of the Sea Bar, for example, from 1980, demonstrates this early conception. In the study, we see these nine square fragments, which have been sourced from the panel design for fragments of sea bear, arranged into evenly spaced horizontal configurations. With extensive and detailed study and comparison, the fragments can actually be located within the original uh, formline sea, sea bear design. Even then, even when we can find the source, the abstract nature of the fragments certainly makes any kind of sure identification with the segments of the original panel nearly impossible. Schopert has taken full advantage of the uniform and cohesive nature of Formine design and its basic visual building blocks in order to deflect any sure recogni recognition of this singular original panel. For example, the source of the elements in one of his earliest square panel arrangements, a smooth round stone from 1981, can be sourced in a very similar way. The composition consists of two by two grid of four square panels that's carved in a fairly low relief. It's been painted all over with a light blue, white, and gray paint and stain that gives it uh, the nominal appearance of a kind of natural stone like its title. The general designs, the fragments have also been cropped from their panel. The lower right square, for example, seems to correspond to the top rightmost ovoid of the panel. The top right and top left squares correspond to portions on the lower left of the panel. The variation between the original formline design and Schopert's interpretation of wood relief and subtle shifts in the card versus drawn and painted curves, as well as different angles to which each fragment has been rotated from its original composition, make these kinds of attributions fairly uncertain, however. The last square on the bottom left, for example, does not seem to correspond to any particular area from the bear panel. It may have been sourced from another design like the sea bear panel, and this is likely intentional um, in the attempt to abstract from within multiple sources. A smooth round stone contains, for example, on this panel, a small white semicircular relief along the top right edge, which does not seem to align with any circular motif in the original bear panel design. I have looked at this a lot, cannot find where this might correspond, um, likely sourced from somewhere else or from an abstract composition entirely. Schopenhauer painted this small semicircle white in contrast to the rest of the blue-gray pigment that accentuates the natural wood grain or the rest of the work. It really stands out. He's really drawing attention to it. This expressionist color treatment across the entire panel applied in a very brushy manner with faint drips and um, splatters is spread across the surface and creates a cohesive composition out of the truncated formine elements. Locating these panels as individual fragments um, especially those of this original bear panel composition, is even more difficult as a result of this painterly treatment. The curves of form lines transition into one another across the panel breaks, and their carved and raised lines shift between positive and negative space. In the early 1980s, Schobert made many variations on these two methods of isolation and fragmentation. Some of his compositions use the fragments from sea bear panel. Some of them take a single linear composition, Others reprise the isolated elements of bear panel, the portions of which he's abstracted as the basis for Big Sky Salmon, as we saw, and these other works, Stillwater, Thin White Line, and many more in his oeuvre. He takes these elements and uh, varies and explores the scale and orientation and color and transformation of them, setting off panels one against one another, flipping them, uh, rotating them vertically and horizontally. Here in Stillwater and Thin White Line, um, both the panels consist of four sections that have been arranged into a large canvas-like panel hung on the wall. Like many of his panels, these are painted with colors very atypical of the classic Northwest Coast palette. There's purple, blue, white, orange, all of which have been applied in quite exaggerated expressionistic painterly marks, especially in still water on the top, um, where we can see these broad brush strokes that have been applied um, uh, alongside drips that are visible on the oil-stained natural red cedar wood. Many of the strokes follow the curves of the form line that's been carved into the, the recesses of the wood, accentuating the negative spaces with dark shading, highlighting other portions, a great example is right here along this edge. Um, in certain portions, certainly the breast strokes also continue across the truncated elements of the panels, connecting them. In other places, they end completely abruptly. 
we can see how both panels feature this now fairly recognizable section of the bare panel. Um, in some cases, they've been rotated 180 or, 300 or, or 270 degrees. The rightmost section here um, from where it's been taken. The palette in each of the works individually un unify within these compositions. And the different sources from bare panels seem otherwise imperceptible. Um, yet they do not cause any incongru incongruity beyond the truncation of these form line transitions. As with all of these works, the painterly treatment of the card surface adds a further layer of abstraction from that isolation and removal. So Schobert's painting both complements and also highlights the carved curves, yet at times also contradicts and ob obfuscates them, obscuring their depth and obscuring the transitions between sections. This far right panel here has been taken um, directly from um, Seabear panel. So we see an example of how he's combining elements that is isolated and fragmented from different compositions within a newer abstract one. In the later Stillwater number two at the Alaska State Museum, um, Schubert takes an isolated portion from roughly the same area of the, of the bear panel as Stillwater one, but he reverses it, um, as you can see here, flipping it, um, uh, rotating it rather 180 degrees. Um, he also adds details that are not present in Stillwater. For example, he adds the details of the trigon in this lower curve, which is missing, you'll see in the original Stillwater. Um, the paint you see in Stillwater number two is applied with much more finish, a much more smoothly modulated panel and palette of blue, purple, and white, and kind of coppery yellows and browns. And while the outermost edges of the panels are flush with one another in Stillwater two, we can see that within the kind of design, he's actually vertically offset each of the sections. They appear staggered, even though the edge is smooth and continuous, which adds again to the abstraction, the kind of breaking and fragmenting of the form line. These transformations further obscure the remnants of the original design. It's not until though the relationship between figure and ground has been the most completely confused that Schobert's abstract impulse most thoroughly disperses figurative or crest form imagery. When he wrote about the four panel piece Kagisak, which is at the Herb Museum in Arizona, Schobert calls the work one of his quote, minimalized Northwest Coast pieces. The panels take this kind of minimalization of form line to an extreme. The elements of form line design have been so reduced that not even singular geometric motifs, not a single U-form or a single ovoid can be discerned within the whole of the panel. Instead, the four carved and painted wood panels seem to consist of just edges of curves, elements and fragments of U-forms and ovoids. Schobert has cropped and zoomed in on the form line design until it's become a completely abstract distillation. The painterly treatment also contributes to this abstraction even further. Schobert described that in Kagi Sa, quote, color successfully develops a shift in field ground relationship, evoking a sense of movement, end quote. We can see in these broad flat strokes of white paint that stretch across the panels. I have a detail here, moving from raised edges to carved out volumes, or on the right hand side where this bright blue line traces from the edge of a curve and seems a transition to a turquoise shaded section that's actually in relief. Here in relief here raised, we see how the colors of the white drips, the splatters, the blues, the purples, the ones that appear in the recessed and the raised areas alike, um, how these from a head on perspective seem to advance the surface of the relief carving forward into a single flat plane, only to be thrown back into relief at the same time by the depth of the carved surface. Um, when one shifts one's head viewing this in person, in the slightest, you can perceive the carved edges at an angle and perceive the shadows of the deep carved forms, um, yet the paint throws them all forward. And this kind of push and pull of surface depth further confuses what used to be, in some source, a primary and secondary form line relationship and confuses any sense of positive and negative space, emphasizing instead the aspects of Northwest Coast treatment of space that people like the mid-century New York school artists, the abstract expressionists, the Indian space painters, these movements of abstraction in, in New York in the mid-century, um, Schubert's emphasizing the play with negative space that these uh, Euro-American artists most admired. The depth of the relief does not correspond with what negative space may have been on the original panels or the original sources. Um, if there's even any correlation at all, we, we simply do not know in this level of abstraction. The title, Kagi Sak, Schopert tells us, roughly translates as the mist in the mountains. 
So even while he's abstracting the form to its most extreme, through his title, he's evoking the essence, the spirit of the place that he says, quote, he glimpsed and captured. It's an impression of Southeastern Alaskan landscapes. If the legible figurative form line design is gone here, totally obscured by the abstraction process, Chopret is nonetheless telling us that there is a relationship to the place that remains cohesive. From the process of isolating and fragmenting form line compositions into such abstract panels, Chopert extended abstraction even further. In panels such as Raven Opens Box of Stars, Chopert arranges thin vertical sections of carved wood of varying length with fragmented form line elements um, rearranged in a kind of offset manner. The title, of course, is again figurative, again narrative, telling the story of the legendary trickster figure Raven, um, who through his guile brought the light of the sun, the moon, and the stars into the world. The title thus suggests a figurative scene, and we might, as we look closely at this panel, perhaps catch a glimpse of what appears to be maybe the fragment of a claw, a fragment of a beak, other curves of shooting stars. Yet, unsurprisingly, no figurative form seems to coalesce from this jigsaw puzzle-like configuration. The figure and ground is simply too obscured. The narrative elements of the origin stories and the oral histories that are implied in the title are abstracted and hidden from the viewer. The abstraction and fragmentation of these vestiges of form line would reach their most extreme in works such as Raven in the Pink. Again, consisting of these offset vertical carved wooden sections and painted in shades of purple and pink and white, Raven in the Pink is much more dramatically cut and fractured than, fractured than Raven opens a box of stars. The curves and elements of form line are disrupted. Um, and here in the deep incisions and clipped geometry is barely visible. Speaking of this piece, Schobert said that, quote, here all recognition of Northwest Coast imagery is destroyed. The form line is lightly referenced and is indicated with the slightest gesture of movement. Juxtapositions of primary, secondary, and tertiary elements are presented out of context, and the visual field is saturated with gradual blendings of color. Although this work appears cubist-like, it arrives at this conclusion from a different language base." End quote. The panel, we can agree, is certainly cubist-like in some of its elements, with its linear curved cuts and gridded format, and the disruption of volume that's achieved for some of this chiaroscuro-like shading of color that confuses the depth of the carved wood with its painted surface. I point you know, to sections like this where I see this, this white highlighting and this chiaroscuro shading of, of, of dark um, blues and purples that really obscure the, the actual depth that he's carved into some of these fragments. So he's taking on some of the um, elements of cubism, not just to dismantle the form and to rearrange its form into these gridded elements, but also to shape them into a much flatter pictorial field adding another layer of obfuscation while also ordering them within the grid of, of the cubist format. The grid format is simplified and formalized in his best known nine panel works, like the one I started with. Um, this work titled Of Clouds and Sacred Cows from 1980 is one of his first compositions in this three by three panel grid configuration. The panels are less bright and expressionistic than his typical work. Um, he uses um, a white chalk to highlight the raised portions of form line, as well as to highlight the recessed nooks of the carved out curves, um, again, contradicting the depth of the relief. And in this kind of contradictory shading and its brown, white, gray palette, he evokes a certain kind of analytical cubism going back to Picasso and, and, and Brock from the 19 teens. Um, the source for these panels though, can be found again, going back to the original design of the sea bear panel and this fragments of sea bear panel that I showed earlier. Each square segment of, frag of form line in Of Clouds and Sacred Cows is in fact based on one of the nine panels illustrated in the study for fragments of sea bear. These same fragments occur in the same or similar arrangements within Schubert, Schubert's other large nine panel pieces. The panels of blueberries, for example, consist of the same fragments of form line as we see on the right of Clouds and Sacred Cows, but it's as if blueberries has been um, rotated 90 degrees. His 1992 panel Thunderhead is the same configuration as blueberries, as we can see here. And then another panel in Search of the Perfect Circle from 1985 is the same configuration, but it's been flipped horizontally. 
So these works vary in their execution of the form line. Schobert carves them and their curves and ovoids are slightly different between each piece. They're not exact copies. There is some uh, variation within his finish. He allows for different angles and thicknesses and depths of his lines, as well as importantly, in his palette, in his painted finish. The lines, when closely compared, seem to swell and shift in different widths and rhythms from their sources. And he adds and removes fine line details within the composition, seemingly at will. The paint scheme also adds further variation amongst the structurally similar panels. It's in the organization of the grid that he seems to create some of the most tension between continuity and breakage. Here, for example, we can see where, again, the curves of the, of the carved form line seem to continue across the cuts of the panels. His painterly treatment really connects the separated panels. I'm pointing, especially here on the left, this painted element that's continuing a, a curve. Um, again, here on the right, this carved curve is continued by the painted brush stroke. He's connecting across these broken edges, linking the wooden form line through his painted line. His brush strokes and drips span the otherwise sundered panels and curves. The division of the sharply cut panels are highly visible, heavily emphasizing the fragmentary of the nature of the extracted elements. As a result, the viewer cannot avoid being reminded these are fragments organized within a grid, but in his painterly treatment, he connects them, he brings them together. In 1987, Schopenhauer described his process for bringing these formal operations together as a language for an uninterrupted Northwest Coast art. I've often wondered what would have happened if Klinga culture was never interrupted, he said. I divested it of cultural intent, social meaning, and accustomed appearances. I introduced freedom of color, fragmentation, abstraction, minimalization. Cultural solidarity once shattered is now seen to be rearranged in individual sections and soft subdued and blended colors. The colors used in this piece join the obvious fragmented sections, unifying the broken composition. The kinds of Northwest Coast art conventions that Schobert speaks of destroying, um, divesting of cultural intent are our form line design, are the U forms of ovoids, they're now fragmented, abstracted, and rearranged in these panels. They're jointed, yet they're cut. Um, and it's through this introduction of what he calls the freedom of color, fragmentation, abstraction, minimalization, that he notes how the colors join the obviously fragmented sections. This brokenness in Schopert is unified, but by no means is it rendered invisible. The painterly treatment has a simultaneous effect of making the sharp breaks between panels even more prominent, even as they join them in a compositional whole. In his gridded panels, color is this all over color as seen in blueberries here. In other instances, it refer refers to literally the raw pigment, those brush strokes that are an index of his hand the trace of a line drawn by his hand connecting across the panels or a thin drip of paint as it falls across the panels pulled by gravity, literally connecting the fragments together. Schopenhauer turns to pigment, turns to color for variations on his car fragments as well as as a unifying force, bringing the panels of each composition together in aggregate through their palettes and within the structure of the grid. This play between unity and fragmentation has broad cultural implications in a, a metaphorical sense. His panels are often discussed as visual metaphors for Alaska Native life, a fragmentation, a metonym for the breaking up of Klingit culture by colonization, and then its cohesiveness, a uh, representation of the wholeness of culture that today remains strong and unified, if different. As he states above, as I mentioned previously, in his panels, he says, cultural solidarity once shattered is now seen to be rearranged, unifying. Schopenhauer describes his process of abstracting form and design, though he explicitly states that he gets rid of this focus image, by which he means those crest figures, which I'm inquiring about in his abstraction. He gets rid of this specific image of the signal of hereditary rights and associated intangible property and lineages. This statement seems very contradictory with the representation of crests and other Klingit epistemologies and property relations, particularly in relation to works that purport what he calls the cultural relevancy of Northwest Coast art. The sharp breaks in the panels ensure that the fragments of line and hints of ovoids and isolated curves cropped from these larger images remain illegible to the viewer as a kind of figurative form line designer crest. And certainly critics within the Klingon Northwest Coast arts communities felt that this precisely was going too far in his work, breaking too far with the perceived conventions of Northwest Coast native art. As the curator Steve Henriksen notes, to Schobert's critics, including native traditionalists, what Schobert removed, the cultural meaning, the appropriate color, colors, and the representation of specific clan crests is the very definition of traditional form line art, end quote. 
So abstraction may have been Schobert's ultimate operation of transgression, using the divest divestment of cultural meaning to work around Klinga prohibitions and cultural protocols. But I, I, I question whether all cultural meaning is truly absent in that sense. Instead, I would suggest there is a kind of cultural language legible in Schopert's vision for an uninterrupted Klingon art, one that has not been fully disrupted by the modernist operations that take form line beyond legibility, but that still give us a kind of remnants of ancestral knowledge and heritage. Northwest Coast art, after all, can be often understood in terms of its crest and form line designs, but many scholars have pointed out that this is too limited an understanding of the ambiguities and social structures that govern Northwest Coast art in general. So seeking to connect the past and the origins of Northwest Coast art and philosophy, I would suggest Schopert's formal operations disrupt only those arbitrary conventions that he saw as barriers to not only his expertise and his movement in the career as a contemporary living Klingon artist, but also as potential barriers to the epistemological truths of Klingon art that he believed could lead to a future art. Indeed, in his writings and public statements, we find that Schobert directly linked his abstraction to a desire to exert in some manner of control a new approach to the representation of Klingon art. He said in 1986, we must gain control over the image of Indian art and involve ourselves in its definition. The more remarkable our ideas, the brighter our vision, the wider the horizon that will open up for us. And his assertion for control over the image is made explicitly political in his writings and his statements. And as he described in this quote that I'm showing now in an interview with Jan Steinbright, he makes that political relationship explicitly connected to land. One of the big issues, probably the fundamental issue, is a sense of ownership of land, not ownership of title and deed, but just a sense of belonging. It is part of their identity. It cannot be eroded. It is a strong mystical relationship with the land. If we don't address it in discussions such as this, we are missing the point entirely. And this profound relationship to land, uh, something that's mystical and not erodible, as Schopenhauer says, undergirded all of his work and his identity accordingly. Northern Formline in his uh, functions of abstraction, in its signifying functions, um, in those curving and swelling forms, Schopenhauer similarly evoked the waves and the undulating forested landscapes that Formline design is embedded in and derives as such that same relationship with the land. His appeal to abstraction was to create art in the lineage of Klingon visual history that could speak to a relationship in a kind of unmediated fashion, not limited by any kind of reading of figuration, not limited by the craze of Northwest Coast art and its associations with the historic past that he, coming to age as a young artist in the 1970s and especially working in the 1980s, witnessed in what we have uh, now tried to move past as knowing as the revival of Northwest Coast art, the resurgence in the 1960s and 70s. Schopenhauer was very influenced by this moment. And despite the critics of his time, his art is not about making the traditional modern. He's instead responding to the modern and using it as a tool to break apart form line, rearrange it and make a new visual language out of its remains. Layered over and under his abstracted ovoids new forms is the application of abstract geometries, painterly expression, and a host of visual influences and imbrications, very few of which I could even touch on today. He intervenes in his works in the grammar of Northwest Coast art, and in doing so pursues a new language by which to express the sovereignty that he believed in. Quote, statements of beauty and balance are important. Equally important is the development of words in a new vocabulary and discovering the ability to articulate them. Some of my works have opened up new space, and although that isn't a theme nor a statement, it becomes vital because of the freedom of exploration it provides." End quote. Schopenhauer, by pulling up this new vocabulary, allows for a movement between aesthetic spaces, which in and of itself is an expression of a kind of indigenous visual sovereignty. So just to conclude in, in my last 30 seconds, Jim Schobert's works we saw are unified in their abstraction, unified in their pigmentation, their color and their gridded structures. They're full of transformations and ambiguities. They're sovereign in the manner of ancestral visual traditions upon which they draw and on which they are based and built. Their foundation is the sighting and the pursuit of an uninterrupted Northwest Coast art, one that is synonymous with a dynamic art that adapts and adopts from world culture to suit its own needs, while also reflecting a deep, political connection to land and place that is immemorial. Jim Schopert expressed such relations in his art that were not just a response to Western modernism, not just a response to what he saw in the art world around him, native and otherwise, but a reconfiguration of the heritage of Northwest Coast art forms. In doing so, he had a dual response, 
one to Euro-American modernism and its limitations, and also response to what he saw as the boundaries of the modern resurgence, uh, resurgence of Northwest Coast art. In his work, he found new possibilities for a future of Klingon art and expanded the conception of both what the traditional and the modern could be in their meeting. Thank you so much for your time, Kunal Shish. I look very forward to any questions and our Q&A. So thank you, Jay. Thank you very much. Our first question from our comments is, uh, where can someone go and see Jim Shopard's art? That's a great question. And given that we're broadcasting this across, I'll say the world, Jim Schubert's art is available not just in Alaska, but in collections really across the United States. And Schubert was an artist who had an ambition to be able to produce work and show and be involved in a world of art that was not just contemporary, not just Northwest Coast native, not just your American, but broad and diverse. And so there are fantastic pieces in his collections around Alaska, the Anchorage Museum, the Alaska State Museum, the Sea Alaska Heritage Institute has a number of his works in their collection, as well as public art that is across Alaska as a result of commissions from the 1% for Art um, Commission Board. So in the 1980s, a huge number of buildings uh, began to feature carvings by him. There are schools, um, there are public buildings, there's a piece in the Anchorage Fine Arts and Performing Center, there's a fragmented form line, massive public sculpture outside of the sports arena in Anchorage, um, but also his work is in collections in the United States in the lower 48, in the Heard Museum in Phoenix, in the Newark Museum, surprisingly, he has a soapstone carving there, um, as, as well as plenty of others. One uh, rarely noticed example is a, a series of carved panels that are actually in, in Concourse C at the Seattle Tacoma International Airport. Um, next time you're going through, it's often the terminal that's, that um, Alaskan Air flies into, you'll see a series of wooden uh, abstract mask-like faces that are carved and installed around a single column in the concourse. Um, so next time you're flying through, I guess, whenever we're done the pandemic, take a look um, and, and, and look for it. All right, our next question is, has anyone considered using copyright law to enforce clan ownership of designs and stories? Really great question. I know that the Sea Alaska Heritage Institute has been on the forefront of this discussion and Dr. Worrell and Sea Alaska recently entered into a, uh, I, I'm not sure if it's been successful, but I know that Neiman Marcus is now bankrupt, um, into one kind of suit that was um, accusing uh, Neiman Marcus, the retailer of copyright infringement for stealing a design by a um, uh, Clarissa Rizal Raven's Tail weaving robe and Neiman Marcus had blatantly stolen the design for a kind of poncho sweater and C. Alaska um, on behalf of Carlos Rizal um, took Neiman Marcus to suit and in doing so they used American copyright law as a means of supporting not just Carlos Rizal's own design but also the Klingit laws behind the design and behind Raven's Tale as a kind of cultural patrimony um, and these are these are ongoing investigations and ones that Jim Schopert as an artist was really moving in between and playing with. Um, in terms of Western, uh, we could say American or European standards of copyright and intellectual property, his abstractions are completely unique constructions that it doesn't matter where you took them from. And we know appropriation art in modern contemporary art is founded on this idea of artistic license to borrow, recreate, and quote particular um, sections of. But that does not necessarily align with indigenous and especially not with Klingit values. And so this question of where the sources of the crest imagery emerge from, where they speak to and who recognizes them is a very interesting place where sometimes Klingit and other indigenous values intermingle, but also function in parallel to Western conceptions of copyright and artistic license. Thank you very much. Our next question is, um, let's see here. Jim Schopert created art in a time during a movement for art revitalization. Do you think he was just ahead of his time as an artist? I absolutely believe that Schopert was ahead of his time in many ways and died far too young. He died in 1992, um, really at, at one of the creative peaks of his career. And it's, it's, it's difficult to think sometimes of what he'd be producing today, what he would be doing with the new technologies. And he is someone who 
move so quickly and so prolifically and virtuosically through different media, different styles that he borrowed, appropriated from, had access to and made use of in incredibly diverse creative ways. And I believe he was ahead of his time in many different ways, not just in terms of Klingon art and Northwest Coast art traditions and the uh, Northwest Coast resurgence, but also in terms of the global movement of contemporary art. He was really intuitively looking at Western modernists, people like Jackson Pollock, people like Alof Gottlieb and the Surrealists, those artists who had themselves appropriated from Klingon art and appropriated from Alaska Native art. And he was responding to them and creating a kind of recursion where we can think anew about what the meanings of abstraction are when they're taken from an indigenous perspective, when we think of abstraction as something that might have a deeper meaning than simply a formal one. And Schubert could intuit these kinds of relationships. He could intuit the kinds of layerings that existed between indigenous art, Alaska Native art more broadly, Klingon art, Western abstraction, surrealism, and many more kinds of movements. And his art is a site for those kinds of investigations. And uh, I think there is so much more work to be done in what he was able to uncover and, and what his art shows us and how those kinds of, in fact, far less hierarchical definitions of fine art um, should be understood and interpreted. My next question is kind of related to that. Uh, would you consider his art as political activism or political enlightenment? I'm, I'm gonna shy away from the, the term political enlightenment um, because I think that uh, I don't wanna associate his, his values with the kind of baggage of the enlightenment in the mm -hmm. Western sense, but he was certainly extremely, extremely politically active. Um, he was a um, one kind of global leader in the Baha'i faith, which had a very strong political tie for him in being able to use spirituality as a means of finding political uh, freedoms and, and new avenues of political movement. Um, he was very much as a teacher at the University of Alaska, as a individual artist involved with trying to break indigenous artists into broader contemporary art markets and find through that means a broader audience for his expressions. And through organizations like Atlatl, other native arts and culture foundations, he was very involved with artists from across North America and Turtle Island in trying to pursue new avenues of American Indian rights and First Nations rights. Um, so whether at home or in uh, areas like Seattle and across uh, in the United States and Canada, he was ex explicit about his politics and the relation that, as I quoted today, that land is the essential question. And his art, I believe and argued today, represents that. Our next question is, where do you see Jim's place in Northwest Coast art? I see, and I should say that um, this presentation is emerging from my recently defended dissertation in which I investigate a number of artists who, um, coming from the Northwest Coast Native art tradition, found a greater kind of, um, uh, a, a greater kind of freedom in expression by intermingling and appropriating and drawing on a variety of idioms and styles from across world traditions. Both, the, both those of Western and European modernism, as well as, as we saw with Jim Schobert, across a variety of indigenous traditions. Um, and I see Schobert as being one of the leaders in that movement, which began to emerge um, with the early work of someone like Nathan Jackson, um, other fantastic artists like Edna Davis Jackson in the 1980s, Lyle Wilson, Lawrence Pollock Wilton in the British Columbian context, artists who were looking to work outside of what some of the restrictions of Northwest Coast art had been um, following the kind of resurgence or revival. And so I see Schopert as an artist who, after the innovations and the essential cultural resurgent movement that began in the 1950s, 1960s, and 1970s, um, he built on that and he was looking to move Northwest Coast art in new directions and to create broader, more, uh, I will say, expansive conversations amidst a variety of traditions. So I see him as someone who was deeply dedicated to the Klingit visual tradition, but also in his attempt to find a futurity for it, to find new directions for it, he was open about looking to many different visual traditions to try and find a new direction. And that's really what he was on the, uh, the uh, vanguard of, was finding where Northwest Coast art could go after its very important moment of resurgence. Uh, my next question is, um, 
would the panel in Anchorage were it to be saved, would that be put back up in the public or would it be transferred to like a museum? I think that is a really important question, one that is really at, 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 at the whim of who, whatever kinds of institutions can come together to save the work. Um, it's a work that I believe should be seen in public. And I know that the Schobert family, his nephew, Benjamin Schleifman, especially his daughter, Shavia, have expressed interest in being able to restore the work, weatherproof it, and refurbish it so that it could be seen in public like it was intended. It was a work that was commissioned and created to be seen in a public context. Now, a uh, hatchery building on an army base is hardly a very accessible location for the public. So I believe for an artist like Schopert, who is such a fantastically important entry in the history of um, uh, especially modern contemporary Northwest Coast Native art, that's a work that should be seen in the public. And whether that is in an accessible public location in a fairly safe condition, um, or whether that's um, at a in, in a gallery at an institution that can give it the kind of uh, care and conservation that it needs. Um, I think I think the public deserves to be able to see it. And it's a monumental work on the scale of house fronts, on the scale of crest poles, on the scale of the art by Robert Davidson that decorates the front of the Alaska Heritage Institute. So I believe it should be in dialogue with these other kinds of modern and also historic um, conversations, which Schober was in the midst of. All right, our final question of the day is, is there anything you haven't had a chance to share yet? That you would like to mention before we finish? Only that um, I, I said it in the presentation, I'll say it again. If you are interested in helping to save and recover the panel that's at the Fort Rich, um, uh, Hatchery in, in Anchorage, um, please, I have my email up. I'm going to share my screen again just to throw my, my email up. Um, please feel free to send me an email um, or contact me through my website. Um, I would love to put you in touch with um, uh, Benjamin Schleifman and the rest of, of Schobert's surviving family to try and find uh, means by which we can save the work. And if you are familiar with any works of Schobert's art that are in public or private collections, they're across Alaska. And despite my research, many are missing and their locations are unknown. And so these are works that should be categorized, that should be known so that um, the public researchers and others can understand the kind of treasures that he left behind across the country. Um, I'm eager to hear of anyone who might have work by Schobert in their private collection or otherwise. Um, so please um, feel free to drop a line and together we can continue to uh, demonstrate his incredible legacy to the breadth of, um, I'll say global art and his contributions to it. Chris Green for sharing your story, your knowledge and your experiences. Can you turn off the screen share? <laughs> Thanks. We have two more lectures coming up during the month of October. You can find the full schedule and topics at our website, sealaskaheritage.org, on our news page. We also have a survey for you to give us some feedback on the lecture series, which can be found at www.surveymonkey.com slash r slash shi lectures. Our next one is Tuesday, October 27th, with Allison Bremner, discussing art in the time of COVID at noon to 1 p.m. Alaska time. Thank you again, Christopher Green, and have a good day. Thanks so much, Jay. Thank you for having me.